I want to thank Pastor Shannon and Pastor Samir and the leadership of NLF Utsav for this kind invitation to speak to you today. Over the last few years as a church family in Kolkata and the pastoral leadership, we have treasured this wonderful relationship with your pastoral leadership. We thank God for your church and especially the wonderful team of dynamic and faithful leaders. Today, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 14. We'll spend a lot of time in this chapter, so I want you to open your Bibles and keep it ready. Romans 14 verse 17 to 18 tells us, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. At this moment, I want you to look at these very familiar faces who you will readily identify. Faces you're used to seeing on television or on your laptops or as you scan on your social media. These faces that you have just seen, this is how I would look like when I used to go to church about 20 years ago. We grew up in another generation that believed that the kingdom of God is holy. And holy people makes this kind of face most of the time. Honestly, looking back, I don't think I'm proud of how I projected Christ through my life during that season of my life. During that season of my life, I judged others based on the days I kept as holy. I am holy because I go to church on Sunday. I judged others based on the kind of moderate clothes I decided to wear. If they were not as moderate in dressing, based on my definition of moderate, they were unholy. I judged others based on the kind of food I ate. I am holy because of what I eat and drink. And if they eat or drink something which I felt was impure, they were unholy. I judged others based on how I worship Jesus. I am holy because of my style of worship. And if people did not worship as expressively as me, something was wrong with them. Something was wrong with their standard of worship. The reason I interpreted it this way, the reason I had this perspective in that season about this experience of following Christ is probably because I never spent enough time in Romans chapter 14. And that's where I want to look at today. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. Some of the believers were disputing over matters of food and drink resulting in division and strife among the people of God. The church in Rome consisted of believers from Jewish backgrounds as well as non-Jewish backgrounds. Jewish believers came to their faith in Christ, bringing extra rules of their background of special food not to eat and special days are more holier than others. The non-Jewish believers had no such rules. So when they started mingling with each other, they started grading and rating their face based on their own cultural backgrounds. I want us to read together major chunks of this passage in Romans chapter 14. It's a long chapter. I'm reading for you in the message translation. Here it is. I want you to listen to it very carefully. Welcome with open arms, fellow believers, who don't see things the way you do. And don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with. Even when it seems that they are strong on opinions, but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while 
might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another with a different background might assume he should only be a vegetarian and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you have any business crossing off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. None of us are permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It is God we are answerable to. All the way from life to death and everything in between. Not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again. So that he could be our master across the wide range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother? And where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I would say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we are all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment, facing God. Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there a bit. Read it for yourself in scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. Forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here is what you need to be concerned about. That you don't get in the way of someone else, making life more difficult than it already is. I am convinced, Jesus convinced me, that everything as it is, in itself is holy. We, of course, by the way we treat or talk about it, can communicate it. If you confuse others by making a big issue over what they eat or don't eat, you're no longer a companion with them in love, aren't you? Are you? These, remember, are persons for whom Christ died. Would you risk sending them to hell over an item in their diet? Don't you dare let a piece of God-blessed food become an occasion of soul poisoning. That's Romans chapter 14, verse 1 to 16, a long passage. Today, we are called to be an irresistible witness. We are able to live that kind of irresistible witness when we experience the fullness of life in the kingdom of God. We experience this fullness of life when we realize we belong to one family. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, makes this important statement. This is what he said. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. We are members of one body, my brothers and sisters. It is the body of Christ. It is not mine to decide how he runs it. Since it is his body, all are welcome, regardless of our background, and ethnicity. And since it is his body, we all have different roles and different functions. He has separate, unique roles for us that helps us to honor God best and serve his body uniquely. Therefore, that means I must be totally satisfied with what God wants to do in me 
and how he functions in somebody else. In fact, my brothers and sisters, I must celebrate how he works in someone else. That also means I welcome people from different cultures into the body of Christ. Friends, today, as you turn to our newspaper, scan social media, the world is divided basis of culture, caste, community, color. People shoot each other because of how people behave differently from who they are. Entire companies and kingdoms are built based on the culture of one community. If the CEO of a particular company is a South Indian, unfortunately what happens is everyone from the board of directors to the sweeper happens to be a South Indian. You see this happening in businesses, educational institutions. And what breaks me, and I think it should break our hearts, when new people walk into the house of God, they see the same cultural divide and hatred. We cannot let go of what Paul describes to the Ephesian church. This is what Paul said. The mystery is that people who have never heard of God and those who have heard of him all their lives, what I have been calling as outsiders and insiders, stand on the same ground before God. They get the same offer, same help, same promises in Christ Jesus. The message is accessible and welcoming to everyone across the board. Wow! I think that should excite you and me today in the 21st century. The message of the gospel welcomes anyone and everyone. So this morning, the kingdom of God we are talking about goes beyond how we live in this world, how politics happens across the world, and sadly, even how we as believers often live in the church. So you are asking me this morning, Pastor, this long introduction, this long passage from Romans chapter 14, what does it mean for me when I walk out of the service? What does it mean for me when I step into my world? What does it mean for me when I join my office tomorrow? When I step into my neighborhood? How do we display our lives as irresistible witnesses? Witnesses who are irresistible, people who want to be one of us because of something different in us. And that's what I want to share with you very briefly in the next few moments. It means three things to us. Are we ready for this? Firstly, live a non-judgmental life. Since we all have experienced the same kingdom of God, and we have all experienced the same love of God, we don't judge the standard of spirituality of a brother or a sister. You, me, your neighbor, we all have to stand in judgment before God. God will judge us. But by nature, the problem is we love judging one another. If we are not saying it with words, we are at least thinking about it in our minds. When we see a person who looks different or dresses different, we present the face of, hello, so good to meet you. You're awesome. But behind their back, we are like, how crazy, I don't like you. Paul presents the alternative to judging a brother or sister. This is what he said. Listen to these words. So let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words. Don't drag them down by finding fault. You're certainly not going to permit an argument over what is served or not served at supper to wreck God's work among you. Are you? I said it before and I'll say it again. All food is good, but it can turn bad if you use it badly. If you use it to trip others up and send them sprawling. When you sit down to a meal, your primary concern should not be to feed your own face, but to share the life of Jesus. So be sensitive and courteous to the others who are eating. 
don't eat or say or do things that might interfere with the free exchange of love. Isn't that amazing? Firstly, live a non-judgmental life. Secondly, live for God's glory. Live for God's glory. It is Lecre Moore, simply known as Lecre, famous Christ follower, rapper, songwriter, record producer, actor. Lecre sh shares this story in one of his concert. A very powerful story. He talks about a recent trip to Hollywood during which he st stepped into a department store to buy a t-shirt. He said not a fancy silk or diamond started, started shirt, just a plain cotton t-shirt. As he pulled one from the rack, he noticed the price tag and thought to himself that it might be mismarked. So he pulled another one only to find the same price on the tag. Really shocked and surprised, he approached the salesperson to question the exorbitant price, $640 just for a t-shirt. The salesperson told him, sir, the price is correct. $640 was the special discounted price. Lecre, he said, he began to question what could be so special about this t-shirt to warrant such a value. Am I going to be healed of some disease when I put this on? Am I going to get some kind of superpower? And this is what the salesperson said. This is what she said. Sir, it's the designer's name stitched on the shirt that adds value to it. And Lecre in the concert, this is what he said. Do you know how valuable you are because of whose name is on you? Listen to these words. Do you understand that your worth and value comes from whose name is on you? God's glory is stitched in your genes and you are here to glorify him. God's glory is stitched in your genes and you are here to glorify him. Amen. First, live a non-judgmental life. Second, live for God's glory. Thirdly, what does it mean to be an irresistible witness for the kingdom in the 21st century? Thirdly, and finally, live an attractive life. An attractive life. We come back to the verse we started with. Familiar verse. I encourage you to memorize this verse. For the kingdom of God it's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Fullness of life is righteousness. Righteousness by the death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus one righteousness which results from a proper relationship with God. This relation, righteousness has nothing to do with our external acts of religiosity. It is the death of Jesus on the cross which gives us this full life. Fullness of life is not just righteousness. Fullness of life is about peace. Peace with God once again because of Jesus. This peace with God fills us with the peace of God which helps us in every situation of our lives. This peace comes by living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible tells us, great peace have those who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. Fullness of life is not just about righteousness, peace. It's about joy. Joy is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And when we are filled with this joy, the kingdom of God explodes in us and fills the world around us with much hope and life. Paul writing to the Roman church. The Romans are powerful people in the kingdoms of the world. Uh, may pay a great deal of attention to eating and drinking whatever they want. 
but for genuine Christ followers, food issues are minor matters which can change to help and benefit people around us. And we need to focus on more important matters of the kingdom of God. What is it? Righteousness, peace, joy. So this is what the Bible tells us. And I encourage, I remind you. So if you want to experience all that God has for you in his promise of life, in all its fullness, remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. When we live this kind of different lifestyle, we become attractive to the world. That's why the Bible tells us, live a lover's life, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Unfortunately, my brothers and sisters, Christ followers have this reputation of being boring people or like I, how I saw myself 20 years ago, a serious people with no joy in their lives. We are attractive because of what Jesus has done in us. And when we are genuinely attractive, our neighbors, friends, colleagues ask questions. They become curious. They wonder, why are you so different? They become captivated. How can I be like you? They ask questions like, can God answer my prayers like he answers your prayers? Fullness of life in God's kingdom, my friend, is for everyone right now, wherever you are. It's also for your brothers and sisters who are not yet in the faith. Your family members, friends, colleagues, neighbors, all of them need Jesus. Does your life look attractive to them? Or even before they come into the presence of God, we have judged them based on how they dress, eat, behave, or worship. You know what? Our life groups are wonderful locations to practice Romans chapter 14. In Kolkata, in our church, we call them care groups. I marvel at how care group after care group, we as pastors walk into, we witness something beautiful happening. How people of different backgrounds, different communities, Come together, have fun, laugh, enjoy a meal together. Hold hands in prayer because of one name, the name of Jesus. New friends and neighbors sitting in these care groups have testified. I find hope here. I find a peace which I don't find anywhere else. My friends, how do I make my life attractive to the world around? As I conclude... I want to share a simple five-fold weekly habits on how to make yourself attractive. It is called BELLS, B-E-L-L-S. Or originally formulated by an author, Michael Frost. I think we can practice these five habits and together ask each other once a week these five questions, these five habits can become a part of our lives. Firstly, B stands for bless. I will bless three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christ follower. How do we bless? By words of affirmation. Mark Twain said, I can live for two months on a good compliment. Acts of random kindness to people around us. B stands for bless. E stands for eat. I will eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a Christ follower. It doesn't have to be an elaborate meal at a big restaurant. Even if you catch up with someone for a cup of tea on a roadside, that's a good start. B-E-L. L stands for listen. I will spend at least one period of the week listening for the Spirit's voice. Either we are always speaking or we are always listening to unnecessary voices. But I invite you at least once a week, give yourself time to switch off social media. Just lose the TV remote. 
get alone and ask God to speak to you. He wants to speak to you if you're willing to listen. B-E-L, the second L stands for learn. I'll spend at least one period of the week learning to be like Christ. At least once a week beside your normal Bible reading, take time to read in one sitting five chapters of one of the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, John. Take time to ask people you trust, meet people and ask them, what does it mean to be like Christ? B-E-L-L. -L. And finally, the last word S stands for send. I'll write journal throughout the week all the ways I attracted others by my irresistible witness. My friend, every time you see God using you to share Christ or connect to people, write it down and pray for your friends. That's why Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19, Paul invites us, live full lives, full in the fullness of God. Amen. How do we do it? How do we become an irresistible witness? Live a non-judgmental life. Live to the glory of God. Live attractive lives. As I conclude, a couple of years ago, I had this privilege to be in a small town called Ubon in Thailand. It's on the border of Laos. And this particular small town, there was a vibrant church fellowship of Thai and Lao believers who practice Romans chapter 14. And over the weekend, the time I spent with them, we attended different house churches. And one of them was led by a Thai believer. During one of the meetings, she shared her story. She started her story by saying she was an AIDS patient. As she shared about her Jesus experience, as I was listening to that story, I was waiting for the point of the story where she was healed of the deadly disease. That point never came. She is still an AIDS patient. But her radiant faith in the midst of her suffering was attracting many to Jesus. In her weakness, Jesus was becoming stronger. It was amazing to see how the entire church, the entire family of the church, looked upon her and welcomed her and accepted her. That's when I was reminded once again, my friends, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray today as we looked at this passage, I pray for the Enel of Utsa family that we will be irresistible witnesses in the 21st century. Witnesses who become like magnets attracting the world around us to Jesus. I pray a blessing upon the pastor leadership upon every believer that help us, Lord, to be followers who live to the glory of God, who live attractive lives. And Lord, we pray we'll be non-judgmental in everything we do. We give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.